Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Vivian Z. She's an associate professor in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Uh, Dr. Z works on energy aware signal processing algorithms and low power circuit and system design. And prior to joining MIT, she was at the R&D Center at TI, where she designed low power algorithms and architectures for video coding. Uh, she received the Jin Ah Kong Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Prize in Electrical Engineering at MIT, and more recently, she has won numerous faculty awards from Egerton, Facebook, Qualcomm, Google, 3M, Air Force, and DARPA. Um, so we're excited to have uh, Vivian bring a circuits and systems perspective to the workshop, and more specifically speak to her work on domain-specific accelerators for machine learning and robotics, and also mention a little bit how open and agile hardware can potentially have an impact on simplifying such design in the future. Great. All right, Thank you so let's much. welcome Vivian. So thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm going to take a slightly different bent from I think maybe with the rest of the speakers. So what I'm going to look at is for, from my perspective over the past, I was counting like 10, 15 years, I've been working on a variety of really compute intensive applications, um, ranging from video compression for my PhD to AI and robotics more recently as a faculty member. In a lot of these applications, there's a huge amount of data that needs to be processed, so there's a growing demand for it. Like, for example, we know that in the case of video, over a billion hours of videos downloaded from YouTube uh, or watched from YouTube every, every day. Um, and of course, deep, uh, deep learning and autonomous navigation continues to grow. Again, for a lot of these applications, the complexity of the algorithms continue to increase as well because there's a huge demand for improved quality of result, right? So in the case of video, you need to compress more because it really <coughs> dominates uh, the internet traffic right now. Um, and of course, we know with deep learning and autonomous navigation, if we have more sophisticated algorithms, we can achieve higher accuracy and better navigation. At the same time, though, for all these applications, we also require very high throughput uh, and low latency, particularly if we're processing a lot of data and we need to interact with the real world. Uh, so for example, in autonomous navigation, your reaction time is very important to help you avoid, let's say, accidents. Um, and then, of course, energy efficiency and power efficiency is very key, regardless of if you do the processing um, in the cloud, which, you know, you know, power efficiency limits how much processing you can do there, or in the edge on a battery-operated device. And so our approach over the past few years to address this is actually to build um, chips or domain-specific architectures to address this from, you know, my own PhD as well as my students' PhDs. And typically it takes around two to three years to complete each of these projects. Um, so I'd be very excited to hear about all the tools that we have uh, or that we're going to discuss today to help accelerate this process. Uh, what I thought would be helpful would be to kind of walk through the key design considerations that we go through in each of these processes so we can see kind of more concretely what are the things that we would need from these uh, agile uh, design approaches. So the first thing we typically look at is how do we exploit the properties of the workload? So this is very typical of specialized hardware. So you have a given workload. You look at, you know, how can I translate the parallelism, you know, the various data access patterns, representations, and the correlation of the data to increase throughput and energy efficiency to meet the requirements of your given application. Uh, what we also like to do, uh, you know, keeping with the vertical integration theme, is we want to go up and actually change the workloads. Uh, we don't view them as something static that's given to us as uh, architects or hardware designers. We want to make the uh, working loads more efficient. So we need to do a co-design of both the algorithms and the hardware. And this is really critical to not also affect the uh, quality of the results. So you need to really keep the application in mind when you're doing this. Um, and then finally, you know, speaking of flexibility, we need to define what is the range of workloads that we actually want to support for this given hardware. And this is kind of like defining what is your domain when we say domain-specific architecture. And really here we need to balance both flexibility and efficiency. Um, and how we actually balance this really, again, re uh, depends on the application requirements. And so really, you know, the question I would like to ask you guys um, as experts here as well, I have some thoughts, but, you know, how can we use Agile and open hardware to help accelerate this design process so we can, um, as Dave Patterson says, shrink it down to, you know, six months would be great for, instead of two to three years. Uh, so to start out with, I'm going to talk about uh, deep neural nets just because that's something we're more familiar with, and then I'll go into robotics. And if we have time, I'll just mention a little bit about video compression. Um, in the case of deep neural networks, you know, there are some a variety of properties that we can leverage when designing specialized hardware. So the first thing is that we know deep neural nets are very uh, parallel friendly. There's just a bunch of multiplies and accumulates at its core, so high throughput is possible. Uh, the real challenge, of course, is actually the memory access, which can be the bottleneck. So we know that, for example, for every multiply and accumulate, we have a four to one ratio in terms of uh, 
reads and writes for each uh, operation. And of course, we know that data movement is expensive. In the very worst case, and you would of course never do this, but if you read these from DRAM, for example, a read or write from DRAM would be like two orders of magnitude more complicated than the compute itself. Um, however, there are also properties in the data that we can ac actually also exploit. So uh, for instance, there's a lot of input data reuse opportunities. Uh, if we look at convolutional neural nets, for example, uh, what, there's a lot of what we call convolutional reuse, where the same uh, pixels or weights are going to be used, um, but just in different combinations. Um, similarly, you often apply multiple filters to the same image or feature map, so then any pixel or activation in the feature map can reu be reused across the filters. Um, and then finally, if you process multiple images, um, often every weight can be reused uh, multiple times across the images. And so we what we typically do is we build specialized hardware to exploit this, so we have a memory hierarchy, and we want to design a, uh, basically a data flow that allows us to exploit data reuse at the low cost portions of the memory hierarchy, so for example, in the local scratch pad. Um, and so we demonstrated this, this is in collaboration with uh, Joel Emmer, which is to build an iris chip to showcase the amount of reuse you can exploit with these efficient data flows. And so, for example, in this iris chip, we can uh, reduce the amount of access to the expensive uh, uh, global buffer by 100x and from the off-chip memory by, you know, three, uh, three orders of magnitude. Um, however, when you take a step back, what we often notice was if we, you know, let's say we didn't care about hardware, just look from an application standpoint, what we really actually care about is the trade-off between energy consumption and accuracy. Um, so we have this plot where we start to look at various different approaches uh, to use to attack, let's say, object detection. Uh, and you can use the traditional hog-based approach features. These are the handcrafted features which were more considered state-of-the-art pre-deep learning uh, revolution stuff. Um, and then there's um, AlexNet and VGG, and of course, we're all very excited about the 2 to 3x, if not more, improvement in accuracy on the um, x-axis that's shown from um, neural nets. But the real challenge is if we start looking on the vertical axis, the energy consumption grows significantly. Um, I should just mention that these uh, various data points are actually measured results from chips that we've taped out within our group. Uh, all in 65 nanometer by two graduate students who start at the same time, graduate at the same time. Anyway, so uh, we tried to do a control experiment here, but the main takeaway is that, you know, um, to get this two to three X increase in terms of accuracy, you're paying about, you know, two to three orders of magnitude increase in terms of energy. And so one question to ask yourself is, let's say on your phone, I said you could get, you know, double three times the accuracy, would you be okay with your battery life dying, you know, 300 times, you know, a thousand times? more, right? So this energy trade-off is very critical. Um, just to give you a reference point for later on, video compression is around one nanojoule per pixel, so we're still very, quite a bit far away from there. Uh, so this kind of motivated us to think, well, is there something we can do from an algorithm standpoint through the co-design to change the workload to bring these points down, maintain the accuracy, but reduce the energy consumption. And so as it turns out, there's a lar lot of uh, work in this field looking at how do we build efficient DNN algorithms. Uh, you might be familiar with things like network pruning where we remove um, some of the weights um, to make them zero. Uh, compact network architectures, you take these large neural nets and decompose them into lower dimensional filters. Um, and also, of course, reduce precision. A lot of this work tends to focus on the number of max and weights. Um, but as, you know, hardware and system folks, what we actually are interested in is whether or not this translates into energy and latency um, savings. And actually, as it turns out, it doesn't. I will just focus on the energy savings um, because of the limit time limitation. But what we basically did was we modeled basically what is the energy consumption of these various nets on, on hardware, for example, Iris, and we looked at the energy breakdown. And as it turns out, for instance, the number of weights alone is not a good metric of the energy. Um, there's other types of data that also move through the system, including the feature maps. Another thing to take into account is that, you know, the energy of the weight really depends on kind of how it traverses the memory hierarchy to get to the processing element. And so not all weights will take the same path. So then all weights are not also not uh, created equal. The way that we got this energy breakdown was we actually designed a tool based on Iris to do the energy estimation. And this is one area where I think agile uh, hardware development could help because we could get faster feedback in terms of where the energy is actually going. Um, but how do we actually take this observation and factor it into the co-design of the algorithm? Well, so what we want to advocate is that rather than targeting um, you know, reducing the max, if you really want to, let's say, reduce the energy, you should directly incorporate energy into the design 
of the algorithm itself, right? So for example, when we compare uh, this to, let's say, something like magnitude-based pruning, in magnitude-based pruning, you would remove the weights that are the smallest, and you, it's pretty effective. You get 2x reduction in terms of energy, but if you actually try and figure out which, which weights consume the most energy and remove those, uh, you can actually get you know, significantly more energy reduction. Right? In this particular case, a 3.7x. We do like a very simple way of incorporating it, but I think it can improve even more. So the, the main message here is that if we had more information about energy or latency during the algorithm design phase, we can do a much better job to get a good trade-off between, um, let's say, energy and accuracy. I should mention for this case, you know, all the accuracies are about the same. Um, another thing that happens, though, is that because of all the excitement and deep learning, there's been a lot of design and not just new models, but a lot of different ways to make, as we mentioned, to make the neural network much more efficient, um, which is great for the algorithm community, but from a hardware perspective, this means that we need to develop hardware to efficiently support this wide range of techniques if we really want to translate these techniques into um, energy savings. So for example, in the case of pruning, you're going to make a very sparse model. So you want to have hardware that supports sparsity, but at the same time, someone could also run on your hardware, a very dense model still, and so you still want to be efficient for that. So you shouldn't have, you know, add, added too much overhead to support the sparsity. So you really need to balance all of that. Um, another example is looking at compact network architectures. This really has implications in terms of the uh, network on chip. Very briefly, I'm just going to talk about, you know, one of the challenges that we face here. So you're going to, you know, have a wide range of um, networks that you can have. You can have low bandwidth that allows you to exploit a lot of spatial reuse and high bandwidth uh, networks that allow you to, uh, not as much spatial reuse, but you can do like things like unicast. And so when you have a very large neural net with a lot of reuse opportunity, ideally you would like to have or use a network that's, you know, something that you would find on the right-hand side where you can do multicasting, for example, and still have very high energy efficiency and high array utilization. In the cases where you have those very compact neural nets where you don't have very much reuse, you would like to have a network that has, that, you know, doesn't require a lot of spatial reuse, but it supports unicast and has very high bandwidth from, let's say, the local buffer. And so, you know, one solution to this would be an all-to-all -all network, but that, of course, is not a very scalable or efficient solution. Um, so you really need to kind of, because of this wide range of workloads we have to support, we really have to innovate in this area. Um, and this is what we would really focused on the second version of Virus. I won't go too much into it, but, you know, we really looked at, you know, designing a more efficient network so we can support a wide range of filter shapes. Um, this is just some results shown up for here um, in terms of mobile net because it also covers a wide range of shapes. We also have to support, you know, a wide range of sparsities, both dense and sparse. Um, and you wanted the network also, the architecture also to be scalable. And all in all, by factoring all these flexibilities, as compared to something that's not flexible, you get an order of magnitude savings in terms of energy and throughput compared to the first version of IRIS. Um, so like the key design considerations, again, just to like summarize it for this particular component, is that, um, of course, we want to design efficient memory hierarchies and data flows to exploit uh, data reuse for neural nets. Uh, there's also sparsity that comes in naturally from the nonlinear ReLU within the system, and so you can exploit that as well. In terms of designing more efficient workloads, we want to, you know, look at workloads that increase sparsity, reduce precision, and have more compact networks. Um, and then we want to drive the design of the algorithms with direct metrics from the hardware, energy and latency, rather than ops and weights. Um, and then we need to support a wide range of workloads because of the number of DNNs, but also the different techniques. Um, so we can see that there's already a lot of opportunities here for agile design in terms of feedback and the algorithmic design and exploring uh, different architectures. Uh, I just want to show how this varies now when you start looking at other applications beyond neural nets. So another area that we've been exploring recently is autonomous navigation. Um, and I'll just give you one or two examples of uh, little, you know, things that you have to do in autonomous navigation. One is just robot exploration in an unknown environment. So if I, you know, drop a robot off and or a person off in an unknown environment, how do you find out the most about that unknown environment? Well, typically you can do that by, uh, one method of doing that is by computing Shannon's mutual information. The idea is as follows, you want to basically go to the places where you can reduce the amount of uncertainty you have on the map. So the places that have the most information is where you want to go. Um, in an actual robotic system, how would you do this? Well, you're basically trying to construct a map of this unknown environment. We call this an occupancy map, so we want to know 
what locations are occupied and what are not. So like the light gray here is not occupied and then the dark black lines are occupied and the dark grays are unknown. So you wanna go, where should I go to scan with a depth sensor, let's say, to find out new information? How do you make that decision? Will you compute this mutual information in the place that has the most mutual information you would go and you would scan there? Um, you scan and then you can update the map and so on. And so this is just shown below a robot that we have like a mini race car that's you know, exploring the space and it's basically trying to go to the place where it has the most information. Um, and so the real kind of processing that we're doing here is actually computing the intersection of the depth um, sensor with the surroundings and you can just basically scan a beam. It's very similar to LiDAR. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is that it's a very parallelizable um, operation. So you can compute all these beams in parallel. Um, and so it's a very parallel friendly operation. The main challenge, it's, which shouldn't be any surprise, is actually data movement or data access. How do you keep all of these cores um, uh, busy and in full utilization? Typically you have to store your occupancy map you know, in a single memory, but then of course we're limited by two port memories. Uh, so what we have to do is come up with specialized architectures based on you know, the data access scheme here. So if you have these radiating patterns that are operating in parallel, you can exploit that feature by basically, you know, breaking your map into smaller memory banks. And then how you actually map different portions of your map to different banks, um, can, you can do it in such a way that you can minimize conflicts between these parallel beams. In this case, a diagonal pattern um, is most effective. And we can see that you know, in any given diagonal, uh, a given number, which is like the access time, or the cycle which the position has access, only, you know, the same number only appears twice at most, meaning that we only access uh, two locations in a given memory bank at a given time. And so with a more customized architecture like this, along with an arbiter, you can approach 94% of the theoretical limit, which is like the case where you assume unlimited bandwidth, and then you can explore the entire map in under a second. So what this is showing, of course, is that if we can build specialized hardware that exploits various features of the data access pattern, we can run much faster um, on a given platform. Um, so in, the, in terms of the co-design of an algorithmic um, thing for this space, uh, one of the other tasks we've looked at is the concept of localization. Basically, you can imagine for autonomous navigation, the first thing you need to do is know where you actually are in the world and where you're actually facing. This is actually also needed for AR and VR. So shown here on the right-hand side is an or left hand side is an example of this. So this is a video that's coming in. You're trying to estimate your 3D position and where you're actually looking at. So this is gonna actually be very computationally expensive, but you can imagine um, for you know, small drone or for AR and VR where it's wearable, you need this to be very energy efficient. So the key thing you can do here is you can co-design the algorithm and the hardware so you can really reduce the amount of data that you need uh, through let's say compression and sparsity. So you can drop the amount of data that you actually need to store on chip to under a megabyte and have the whole solution fully integrated. And of course, it'd be actually no surprise that it's gonna be orders of magnitude more um, efficient than a CPU. In terms of the flexibility that you need for this space though, um, another thing in terms of robotics is more how you interact with different environments, right? So you can imagine you, as you navigate, your environment actually might change. Um, and a typical example of this is the Euroc data set that we use for uh, evaluating the you know, drone navigation. It actually contains many, a variety of uh, you know, different sequences with a variety of levels of difficulty. So you can have scenes that are very dark and very motion blurry. And so what you want your hardware to do is to adapt to these different environments so that when it's easy to navigate, you can either run faster or save energy. And when it's hard, it can ramp up, right? This is kind of like dynamic voltage frequency scaling, but more from an algorithmic standpoint. And if you can do this, um, you can actually get you know, another two to three X reduction in power consumption. So the, the takeaway here is again, going through these three key design approaches. One is you know, optimizing specialized hardware uh, for, in terms of banking and mapping to meet the memory bandwidth requirements for high throughput processing. Um, another thing is designing more efficient workloads using really like through the co-design having compact representations of the data that you have on the system and that can really accelerate the processing and reduce the power consumption. And then in terms of flexibility here, it's different from the neural net space in the sense that you want to adapt to different environments and use that to achieve improved efficiency. Um, okay, so very briefly, I'm gonna talk about uh, video compression, which is completely different than these other spaces, but it's actually uh, you know, an application that we all widely use today. Right? Um, and so if you take a look at how 
a video codec is designed, it's actually very different from you know, deep learning and some cases autonomous navigation in the sense that it's actually composed of many heterogeneous modules, right? One of the things with deep learning is that we have all these processing elements that are the same and we just, you know, map onto them in different ways. But here, you're actually built up of many, many different types of modules from entropy coding to transforms and so on. And the typical strategy people take for this is they build specialized hardware for each module. And in fact, because it's standardized, they even, in fact, hard code the parameters for each of these modules. So you can imagine in the um, you know, interpolation filter of the motion compensation, the weights of those filters are hard-coded, which is very different from um, in deep learning when we load new weights, similar to the coefficient transforms. We also have dedicated memories and data flows for each module. They can be all very different. And of course, you can use parallelism and pipelining to speed up across modules and within modules. So this is much more hard-coded than, or much less flexible than um, the other applications. Um, here we can still look at kind of the co-design of both the algorithms and the hardware together. In particular, um, as it turns out, as you go to more advanced video compression algorithms, it becomes much more difficult to parallelize. This makes sense in the sense, in the, in the sense that as you try and compress things, what you're doing is you're removing redundancy, which means you're introducing dependencies. Um, so it's gonna be much more difficult to run in parallel. And of course, this is gonna limit throughput uh, due to Amdahl's law. And so what you wanna do is to introduce some parallelism or redesign the algorithms. One area where this is a challenge is the entropy coding engine known as CABAC in uh, the video standards. And so you can redesign the algorithms um, in such a way that you're balancing coding efficiency and throughput. I think that's very um, careful. You have to do that very carefully, but then you can get an order of magnitude speed up without sacrificing accuracy. So this is really understanding the needs of the hardware and then changing the algorithm to fit the hardware itself. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is, that, so this, you know, this uh, co-design part was more of a PhD project of mine, but then um, this is actually something that we put into play an actual video standard and products that are used out there worldwide. This is for the HEVC standard that was developed in 2013 as a successor to H.264. Um, like every standard, every new standard, you want to get a 2x reduction or 2x improvement in compression. But the new thing that was additional challenge for HEVC is that it had to support both high throughput, so high resolutions, high frame rates, and low power, because obviously, you know, video is really a must-have feature that we now need to have on our phones in 2010, 2013, which didn't, we didn't have that requirement back in 2004 when H.264 was developed. So in the standards development, they also take this co-design approach where in addition to having new features or new tools that give you better compression, they also have new tools that um, allow you to implement the standard in a more efficient way. And so as a result, you know, rather than uh, increasing the uh, energy cost by 4x, is only a 50% increase this time around. And this is really the co-design of both the hardware and the algorithms um, to balance all the uh, diff various different challenges. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that there is still some flexibility that's needed in video compression. Um, typically, they use it to support multiple standards. So, of course, video that's, you still want to decompress video that you, you know, captured maybe a couple of years ago on a different standard. Uh, typically, the only sharing that they can do in this space, because they hard code so much, is things like the cache for motion compensation, these larger blocks. But they're willing to trade off you know, the, the cost of having these hard-coded blocks in the area, they just basically stamp out mul multiple uh, different encoders uh, because they really have super tight uh, speed and power requirements, right? So everybody wants to watch HD video, you know, in real time on their phone. Um, and so, and we saw that there's that huge gap in terms of neural nets and uh, video coding, and this is one of the reasons why, because of the hard coding itself. So this is very critical. The other thing is that the encoder, even though the decoder is standardized in these standards, the encoder is actually flexible. It allows different you know, companies to do product differentiation. Um, so there's still some flexibility that's required. Um, so in terms of, again, looking through these you know, three key concepts in the video compression space, they have much more specialized hardware for these heterogeneous sets of modules with hard-coded parameters. Um, there's still the existence of the idea of co-design of algorithms and hardware is also very prevalent actually now in the video um, compression space. Uh, and then in terms of flexibility, it's a different type of flexibility, but they still have to you know, adapt to different types of incoming video. So their concept of workloads is different, video, different you know, standards and algorithm changes at the encoder. 
Um, so just to summarize, you know, so the key takeaways are as follows. We all know that domain-specific uh, hardware is good for um, addressing the compute demands for these applications. In terms of opportunities, the things that we're already still already doing, you know, we're exploiting properties of the workload um, and doing a lot of co-design of the algorithms and the hardware. Uh, I think the challenge in this space is kind of figuring out what is the definition of flexibility across this space? What are the range of workloads you actually want to support? Um, in particular, often these workloads will continue to evolve with these rapidly going spaces like uh, neural nets and also across different use cases and environments. So we have to figure that out. I think, you know, from my perspective, where I can see agile hardware design helping a lot is allowing us to do rapid exploration of these trade-offs and also between the algorithms and the hardware itself and iterating much faster. Um, in terms of the open hardware, it can allow, of course, for rapid system deployment with shared building blocks. I think there are some caveats to these shared building blocks. We need to be able to configure them for different um, application requirements. So some applications really require you know, super low power and they're willing to pay off, let's say, from, trade it off for more area. Let's say video coding is one of those. And so you want to be able to configure that block for those. Um, another question I would have is like, what is the uh, granularity of these blocks that we actually want to share? Do we want to share like the whole, you know, IP block or different modules in the hopes that there's more overlap there. Um, and I think that's it. So I think that concludes my talk. Yeah, so that's really a challenge that we have. So in the case of Iris, uh, actually, Yushin, who's in the audience, and other student of mine built like an energy estimation module based on the data flows and the you know, operation, like memory access counts and so on. But certainly, uh, it's still an estimate, right? But th that gives us a better result than just you know, counting the number of weights. But if we have an even better energy estimate, that could help, right? Um, it's pretty good, but that's also because we design the hardware. It's like it's all closely designed together. Right? We, we reiterate ourselves, but it would have been nicer to have a tool that could do it more efficiently. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the question is, are these more um, ASICs or you know processors? So I would say. I would say oh. they're more, more ASICs or they're more like system on chips where there is a process where they program to configure these components as a variable. Um, okay, so we for all of these when we test the chips, we you know connect them to an FPGA and FPGA will configure them, right? In the in some cases for like the Navion chip, we actually run like an ARM. Um, on the F, on the like on the zinc processor to configure them, and there's some alignment with that for the iris. There's a significant amount of configuration we have to do to support. Yeah. So if you see this type of uh, design with accelerator in the future being available as open source, what's the risk of that? You can integrate in a larger system mm -hmm. with all the entire by processor. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, so the question is how would you interface these type of, I guess, chips with a RISC-V processor, for example, as a configuration? I mean, in the spirit of having highly reusable components. Correct. I mean, I think that's a good question. I would do, okay, so I would say it's, right now, I would, the easiest default is the same way that we interface it with an FPGA, which is in a pretty straightforward band. So these are the parameters that we need to configure this chip. And this is, you know, how you would configure to run. I think the, the um, Iris one also, like whenever, in the, we actually interfaced it with the GPU in the sense that whenever the GPU called, or the ARM processor of a Jetson, whenever it called, you know, convolutional layer, it would just run it right onto that particular piece of hardware. Uh, I don't remember the details, but I think it's just an ad hoc solution, yeah. So I would say, and the student is right here, so you should get answer that too. But I think what we did was we did a more of a high level exploration, um, and then I mean, you should just implemented the RTL in like three weeks. Okay. 
<laughs> if I would say that, but because um, it's actually a very regular design. But we did a lot of exploration before we went to our two high-level one. Yeah. Great. Okay.